All right. Hey, guys. We're super excited. Welcome to our It Works Team Bible Study. I can do hard things. I do hard things. This is going to be so much fun. I think it's not only going to help us in our journey with the Lord and in our business, but definitely with our um with our lives and our marriages, our relationships. And so we're super excited, but we just wanted to start this off with prayer. Y'all can hear us, right? Cause I see somebody can't hear. You can hear us. Yeah, we're good. All right. Awesome. So Chad's just going to start us off in prayer. Okay. Father God, uh, I just thank you for this group of people, Lord. I know there's a, a lot of things every person on this zoom could be doing right now, Lord. And uh, we all just are, are setting our lives to the side right now. Father, we, we come, just come before you. I just pray, Father, that that everyone on here would would feel fill, filled up after this Zoom today, Lord. I pray that they would be excited about uh, this new study that we're going to go through, Lord, and and just have high expectation of life change for themselves and for their friends and for their family. And I just pray, pray, Father, that you would use us today to get your message to your people. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 And so you guys, we just want to kick this off. So obviously tomorrow is going to be the first day that we start really reading this and diving into it. What I love about this book is that it's not just um, something that you read. It's very interactive. And you're going to see as the days go by, there's more interaction that you're going to have. There's, if you have the actual hard copy there, you can use it as your journal and write in it. And you've got, um, you know, it's going to give you Bible verses, scripture, but you actually have to look it up yourself. And that doing all those things that this is having you do is going to really deepen your relationship with the Lord and, and help you just go deeper into what God wants for you. And um, so I guess we just kind of wanted to start this off. A lot of you know, Chad and I's story. Um, but I, but we just want to kind of let you know where, where we were and just how far God's brought us and what he's done in our lives. And so, um, when Chad and I met 14 years ago, wow, it's wow, a long, long time ago, 14 years ago, we met, um, I, neither one of us knew the Lord. Um, Chad was singing in rock bands. He had six warrants for his arrest when we met. And, um, I had, I was still doing drugs on a regular basis. I was still trying to medicate my painful past. I was running from everything. Um, in my past, I was sexually abused as a child. I was physically abused as a child. I was verbally abused and, and physically abused as a teenager on into before I met Chad. I dated guys that used me as a punching bag and, um, that was just my norm. I was looking for love in all the wrong places. My parents got divorced when I was little. My dad wasn't around as much as I would have liked him to be. And um, when my mom was 24 years old, I was about five. She had to have a hysterectomy because she had um, cervical cancer, endometriosis, and just a bunch of female things going on. So she had a full hysterectomy at 24. And um, it's like when my mom had that surgery almost immediately, it's like she went from being this amazing, loving mom to a uh, bipolar psycho. And, I, and I, I, my mom and I are so close today. So I, I'm just trying to be very transparent with you guys. I, I, there's, she completely changed from one person into a complete different person. And it was because when they did the um, when they did the full hysterectomy, they couldn't get her hormones right. And when you have a hormonal imbalance, it literally can, it can fry the circuits of your brain. And I never knew what kind of a person that I was dealing with. My mom could be happy one moment and crying the next and to, you know, freaking out and hitting us for no reason. And so we had that going on. We, we were dealing with that as a child, but I'm, I'm just kind of telling you all this stuff because I want you to understand that you guys see me as Jerry Canella, Ambassador Diamond, and oh, wow, we have this amazing house, we have this life, blah, 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 but I want you to see just how far um, we've come and what, what God's really done in us and through us. So when I was a junior in high school, um, I dropped out because I have a learning disability. I have a really hard time reading and retaining things. Like being in the back office for me is a, is a struggle because it's just there's so much going on back there and it's really hard for me to focus on it. And um, so I felt stupid uh, a large portion, portion of my life. And so I ended up dropping out my junior year. And then everything in me from that point on was pretty much on the run. Um, I did end up 
mustering up. I don't know how I did it. It was by the grace of God at that point that I was able to get my GED and then go to beauty school. Beauty school was easy for me because, yes, there was a lot of book work that you had to do and learn, but it was all hands-on training after that. And so I was really, really good at learning in that way. So I started doing hair. I had a great career going. I started building my clientele, and I started feeling a, a sense of purpose and a sense of, wow, I, I'm accomplishing something. But right around that same time is when I started dating the real idiots that – um would manipulate me, control me, and um, hit me. And so I started just becoming a sh more of a shell of a person, if you can imagine that, and started to um, just become, I, I became a victim, and I felt like I was unworthy. I felt like I could never do any better. I felt like I deserved the abuse that I was going through. I felt like there, I could never do any better, and that it was all my fault. And so I started doing drugs. I did a lot of ecstasy. Um, I don't know why that was my drug of choice, but for me, that's what it was at the time because I could completely just go to a different world and not think about my current circumstances. And um, so I did so much of it to the point where I started having drug-induced seizures. And, I, and they would just come on randomly whenever. And not to mention, I was smoking weed. I was taking popping pills. I was doing everything, but I did a lot of ecstasy. And um, so when I started having seizures, and they would come on so randomly, I had to step down from doing hair because I was afraid and the doctors were afraid that I was going to have a random seizure and hurt myself with the scissors or hurt one of my clients. So, and plus I couldn't drive at that point either. So I lost at my own, it was my own fault, but I lost what I felt like the only thing was that I accomplished in life. I'm really trying to set this up for you guys. Um, whenever I met Chad, it was literally within... It was months, maybe six months after I had stepped away from doing hair. And I met him in a bar, if you can imagine that. Like I said, he was a rock singer. So um, a guy that I had dated, this is really Jerry Springer. So a guy I dated when I was 19, I met Chad when I was 23. But I dated a guy when I was 19. He died in a car accident. And um, Chad happened to be one of the bands that played at the benefit that his family had for this guy. Now, now this guy that died, he and I were together when I was 19. And then we broke up because we were young and dumb. And then Chad and I met when I was 23. Okay. I just want to make it that he didn't die while I was with him. It was after the fact. So we had put on his family and I had put together a benefit for, um, for him after he died. And Chad happened to be one of the lead singers of one of the bands that we asked to come and play there. And so when I met Chad, I wasn't even out of a relationship with, um, this guy named Mike. You guys, I was such a hoe back. Like, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to be real. Like, I literally um, did everything in the wrong way. So I, I'm going to jump around a lot of different things. Here. So Mike and I were still not broken up, but Mike was absolutely the worst relationship that I'd ever been in. This guy would take ashtrays and hit me in the face with them. So I was in and out of the emergency room for two years. And um, <laughs> I love you too, Noel. Um, I literally was afraid that he was going to either kill me if I left him or that he, he, there were times where he would pull a gun out and put it in his mouth and say, if you leave me, I'm going to kill myself and it's going to be all your fault. So there was so much manipulation and control that went on there. And you can imagine how it messed with my mind at that point. So anyway, when Luke died, the guy that I did when I was 19, for whatever reason, when I was driving up to go to that funeral, I remember like just thinking about like, okay, God, like I had this quiet time in the car, two hour drive. And I was like, okay, God, if you're real, like if you're, if you exist, I need you to help me because if you don't help me, he's going to kill me. And if he doesn't kill me, I'm going to kill myself because I can't live like this anymore. I can't live like a prisoner anymore. I can't do this anymore. And I didn't hear God's voice in that moment, but I just, I just knew that I had to reach out. It was like a desperate attempt. Like if there's anything out there, like if there's any entity out there that could possibly help me in any way, like I need you, I need you, God. And, um, it was a month after that time that I met Chad and at the, at the benefit. So there was a month between Luke dying and the benefit that happened. Well, 
for whatever reason, because Luke died and because of all that, that transition happened, it gave me the strength and I'm sure it wasn't even Luke. I'm sure it was God because I reached out to him that day. And through that 30 day course of time, I was able to start separating myself from Mike and, and, and starting to feel like instead of being like, Oh, um, like, please don't kill yourself. I was like, you know what, if you're going to do it, just pull the trigger. Like, just to get into that mentality, like, I'm not going to take responsibility for your actions. So I, I'm just going to, um, if you're going to, if you're going to do it, then you're doing it because you want to do it, not because of me. And so anyway, met Chad at the bar and you want to tell the story about the bar? I was going to tell a little my background. Too. Oh, go ahead. You go there and then we'll talk about the bar. <laughs> we wanted to kind of set this up to, so you guys get the full understanding of how broken and how, how low we had gone in our lives before. God start turning all around. So I think that's really important. So on my end, I felt like when I was growing up and in grade school and stuff that it was, it was um, pretty normal. The big thing for me was that my, my dad was worked real hard, but I always felt like I could never do anything. I could never be good enough. Right. So I, I kept, I kept wanting the approval and, and wanting uh, love from him and, and never really felt like I was getting it when I was younger. Well, when I was 15 years old, I discovered alcohol. Um, my dad had always had it around, and so I started drinking, and I, I felt like I was a super, kind of like a superhero. You know, I wasn't shy anymore. I wasn't nervous. I wasn't scared and fearful. I, along the years, became scared and fear, fearful, like the guy who would um, get called on in class, and I'd feel like I was going to pass out just to answer a question, right? That was me. And so I discovered alcohol, and alcohol, it, it, my, my whole world became around where is the party this weekend? Like the only way I felt like I could have fun at a certain point in my life is if I was drinking. So I, right out of high school, I went into the, the army and through the army, you know, I just partied more, I partied more and partied harder. I was in Germany by the age of 19. So there's no limit there. So I just was, I was drinking pretty much every night of the week. It was just getting crazy. And then I discovered, um, they, that's kind of when karaoke started and I discovered I could sing and it made me feel good because when I would sing, people would clap. And they would like me and it just became a great way for me to meet other people and find girlfriends and stuff like that. And so I got out of the army, went to college and I was an acting major and I started experimenting with all kinds of drugs and I started um, just medicating even more. I started drinking more and there was a season where I don't think a weekend went by for 12, 15 years where I wasn't drunk at least one time that weekend and usually three or four times a week. I mean, I'd had different spots I would go party at. And so that's where I was. And then as that happened, I, I've kind of started to feel like I was finding success in different bands, but I'm singing rock and roll and I'm hanging around rock and roll and doing the rock and roll lifestyle. And I started to not care about the other things. So I ended up with a DUI. I ended up with six warrants from my arrest. I ended up with uh, thousands of dollars in parking tickets. Cause I was like, I don't care. And when I would get a ticket, I'd be like, I don't care. I'm not going to pay it because I'm probably going to be dead by age 27 anyway. Cause my, my idols at the time were Jim Morrison and Kurt Cobain and all these rock stars that still to this day, you see dying every year because they're chasing the wrong thing of how, what they would think would be make them happy is really making them miserable and depressed. But that was the life that I was living at that point in time. And I remember I had a friend, and we just kind of challenged each other. We're like, let's see, when's the last time you've gone two weeks without drinking? I was like, never, you know, it'd been, it'd been forever. So um, we had just kind of challenged each other and, and we had gone through that. And I just remember wondering, is this all there is to life? Is this it? And through that process, I had a 15 year old brother that uh, committed suicide when I was 26 and he was 15 and uh, shot him. He had a breakup with a girlfriend and shot himself and had to go through that with my family. And I was very, I was suicidal myself and depressed at the time. And I felt like the only thing carrying me through was, was um, I saw my, what my family went through. So I didn't do that. I had gotten a relationship with a woman who was already married back then and started seeing her. And ultimately she got divorced and I married her. And that lasted like not even a year. And it was just, it was just miserable and it was horrible. And so many times I wanted to end my own life. And I thought I can't because my parents, I saw what my parents went through and that would hurt them. That would kill them for me to do that. So setting this all up. So that's kind of where I was. And I it was the same situation as Jerry. I just said, I can't do this anymore. Lord, I need your help. I need your help. And this is when I was about 30 years old and I had all these problems 
And so, so tell them about that the day, band. so this day, um, so my, the drummer in my band at the time, we were called One Shot Twice, and the drummer had a son, because I was always in these bands with guys who were older than me, so he had a son, and his son was really good friends with Jerry's ex. So when Jerry's ex passed away in the car wreck, they asked if we would come be one of the bands to play at the benefit, and of course we would. And they asked if I'd be the sound guy and run sound, of course. So we go to this little place in Hudson, Illinois. Now we go to this place, and uh, I was supposed to have a girl meeting me there. She's, she didn't show up. I don't remember why, but she didn't show up. And I'm sitting there and running the sound and everything, and I'm looking around. You know, and at that point in my life, I'm just like looking for love in all the wrong places, right? I'm just like looking, looking, trying to find something to fill my void, which was just bottomless pit, right? And all of a sudden, you know, this is a place called the Sitting Bowl. It's in Hudson. So picture kind of like a little, little tiny town with, you know. A little tiny dive bar. Yeah, little dive bar. So, I mean, we're just kind of there and I'm like, I'm looking around. I'm like, these women here aren't even like prospects, right? They're like older and I'm just like, oh man, that's where my mind was then. And everyone was just kind of dressed like, you know, little dive place or whatever. And then Jury walks in the door and she has this white dress on. It's like Cinderella walking into the ball, right? She did not fit in there at all. She came walking in. I couldn't, I, I think the whole place probably just stopped speaking and just stared at her for a few seconds and was like, uh, who is she? And is she lost? And what is she doing here? Right. <laughs> and I was kidding. And I like elbowed my, my uh, guitar player standing next to me. And I said, Tim, that is my future wife. And he elbowed me and says, no, man, that's my future wife. I'm like, okay, we'll see. So, you know, I was just kind of joking around, but, um, so our band played and, you know, and of course I was trying to like give, give Jerry the flirty eyes and stuff. You know, I'm like, I'm in my, I'm singing now, I'm in my band, you know, I'm, I'm smiling at her and stuff like that. And then, so I, I had to figure out how I could get her phone number. So I said, um, you know, I started talking she said, well, I live up around the uh, St. Louis area because she was living there with her mom. And I said, well, next time we never played in St. Louis, but I said, next time we come and play in St. Louis, you should come watch us. So let me get your number so we can uh, connect. And she's like, okay, sure, I'll give you my number. So I got her number and I ended up calling her uh, later that night. Okay, and, so so oh, let me, okay, so first of all, I was drunk. Okay, because I probably, if I was on my game, I wouldn't have fallen for the old, if I'm ever in your area, I'll come see you. But I was drunk. And um, he called me right after I had gotten back to my grandparents' house, which they live in Bloomington. And he's like, hey, you should come out and go to this um, karaoke bar, because he had already serenaded me. And I was like, I really wanted to go, but I was like, I don't really, like, I don't really know him. So I called my friend Jeanette, right? Jeanette, she's my little, like, four foot tall, little firecracker okay and I'm like Jeanette I need you to be my wingman like you got to come with me like I don't know this dude but I want to go hang out and I just I need you to give me your nod of approval yes or no so Jeanette's like okay I'll go with you so Jeanette comes out with me he's like singing bed of roses and kicking over chairs and tables and like you know just whatever and I'm still drinking and so I just want you to understand this so at that point in time even though I wasn't thinking real clearly, I was thinking, I thought to myself, I still hadn't broken things off with Mike fully. I still was teetering back and forth. And I thought, and this is in my brokenness, my broken, not saved mind. I was like, if I sleep with this guy, then I'll never be able to look Mike in the face and I'll be able to walk away. So I was like, Okay, so I went home with Chad that night that I met him and I slept with him because I was a hoe. That's just the bottom line. I had hoe tendencies back then. I had daddy issues and that's just my reality. And so we slept together. The next day, I couldn't even remember what he looked like and that freaked me out that I couldn't. No, wait, don't judge us because this was 14 years ago. Right. So We're, We haven't got to the change part. The yet. next day, I couldn't even remember what he looked like and I was just like, okay. I have to go, like, I would have never called him again. I just was like, but I, I can't live with myself if I don't remember what his face looks like. And so I called him, and I was like, hey, can we meet tonight? And he's like, yeah, but I had to go meet him at this downtown at this this bar because he was doing a business meeting. He was, in, he was in another network marketing company at that time. And I walk in, and there's nothing but a bunch of guys standing around in suits. And I was like, oh, my God, which one is he? They're all just standing there and I walk up and they're like, Hey, who are you looking for? And I was like, 
I'm looking for Chad. And I was like, and I'm thinking, oh my God, please don't be Chad. Don't be Chad. Please don't be Chad. Because I didn't want him to think that I didn't know who he was. And he was like, oh, Chad, yeah, he's inside. He's in there. And pointed out, pointed him out. And I was like, oh, thank God. And so Chad and I, I was like, can we just go? He's like, ooh, he's even hotter than I remember. I was like, can we just go somewhere and just like, like talk? And so we ended up driving and going and sitting at a park and talking. And what's crazy is my intention was not to have a connection with him. It was just to like, I just needed to know for myself, like, holy crap, like, I, am I really this bad of a person? Like, I've hit low, but I, am I that low? And so we went and sat and we started sharing stories and he shared with me about his brother and I shared with him about my abuse. And it was just this weird, like very codependent, very unhealthy, but at the time we were each other's safe place. And, um, so I, I went home, I broke things off with Mike. I moved to Bloomington. We talked just, on the phone for like three straight days. Yeah. I moved to Bloomington, got my own little, I had a little apartment next door to my grand, like it, attached to my grandparents' house. He and his dad came over that night because they were going to like help me move in. And then Chad just moved in and never moved out. So like literally a week after we met, he moved in with me and then two months, well then wait, we got to talk about two weeks, two weeks after we met. We were at a bar, if you can imagine that, and um, we were just hanging out. He was singing karaoke, and next thing you know, here comes like three cops in, and they're hauling his ass out, putting him in handcuffs. He's got six warrants for his arrest, and I'm like, huh? here's how broken and dumb I was, okay? Because most normal people would be like, this is like, you get arrested two weeks into the relationship, you're just like, okay, I'm out, like, I'm out. I'm broken, he was my safe place, so I'm like, I'm gonna bail him out. I'm going to use my savings and I'm going to feel him out because I love him. Like that's my man. So I went down to the police station at, I don't know, it was probably at like two o'clock in the morning before I finally was able to get there and, and work it out and paid $600 for the hundred dollars for each warrant to get him out. And of course, at that point, just for I, those of you wondering, it was, it was nothing. It wasn't anything. It was well, like parking tickets and peeing in public. A lot of public urination. Don't the, recommend that. Yeah, don't do that. Especially near a cop that it runs down by a shoe. Like, that's a bad idea. Don't not pay parking tickets because eventually it will lead to a warrant for your arrest. So don't ignore those little parking tickets and definitely don't drive on a suspended license. So we're good. We're good. We're good. So I bailed him out. And of course, then he was like, yeah, I know she's the one for me. Cause she, that, she's my baby. She's got my back and well, everything. Here's one, let me give one of my first aha moments. Okay, so I had to go to jail for two weeks from all this stuff, right? Basically because of driving on a suspended license after I'd had a DUI. So it all piled up and it's like in the state of Illinois, mandatory two weeks. So I had to go to jail for two weeks. So when I was in jail, I decided I want to read the whole entire Bible because I was like, how much lower can I get? And but I was that like, was I while I was change. pregnant. You, you skipped. Hold on. Oh, I skipped. The you did. You part. skipped. You skipped the pregnant part. So two weeks after we met, he got arrested. He didn't go, He went to jail for the night, but then later on he had to go to jail for two weeks. But so two weeks into the relationship, he got arrested. At two months in, I found out I was pregnant. Holy crap. So here we were still doing drugs, still partying, still living the high life, blowing through my $4,000 savings that I had saved up. Cause I, through all my brokenness, through all of my craziness, I was still managed to save $4,000 and not have any debt. I have no clue how I did that, but somehow I managed to do that. And, but we blew through it because we're partying it all the way, um, over that time. And then reality, oh my gosh, reality set in, holy crap, I'm pregnant. Like God knew that I would never change for myself. Like, because I didn't care about myself that much. But what he did know is that I was going to be a great mom and that I was going to be able to turn away from my past lifestyle, the drugs, the partying, the sleeping around, whenever I knew that I had a child that I had to protect and um, be a mom to. And so that for me was, like I always talk about, Gavin, he was a surprise, but he was he was not an oops. He was never a mistake. He was God's gift. God gave me Gavin at an unconventional time to help me um, really start to see. Like, I, in a lot of ways, Gavin is the reason that we decided to seek out the Lord. So, Our motives were so wrong because at the time I was thinking, I need to get Jerry help so she can be a good mom. And she's thinking, I need to get Chad help so he can be a good dad. 
instead of, you know, now we look back, we realize God was saying, you both need to get fixed yourselves. <laughs> right. So I remember we were fighting over like whether or not we were going to go to church, if we were going to go to a specific denomination of a church. Um, and, and we never could come up to any conclusion. So I was working as a waitress at Cracker Barrel at the time because I, well, I worked at Cracker Barrel when I was younger and I freaking loved the food and I was going there all the time because I was pregnant. I craved she had biscuits, biscuit cravings all biscuits day long every and day. hash brown casserole. Like I, like that's like that's like and Gavin was born like manna the Pils, from the heaven doughboy because so many he was made of biscuits seriously okay so I was like well if I'm gonna be eating this much stuff and paying this much money for Cracker Barrel I might as well work here and get stuff for free so anyway so I'm working at Cracker Barrel and this guy comes in and he is super nice to me leaves me a great tip and he's just like um hey look I'm a pastor at a church down the road we would love to have you come in and and we weren't married at that. He, I don't, he's like you and, and your baby's father come in and just, you know, come to church, hang out. And I thought he had such a great personality. So I was thinking, Oh, Chad can recruit him into this other network marketing company that he was in. I'm like, he'd be great in our company. He'd be great in the business. So, um, I got, I took his information solely so that Chad could recruit him whenever I got home. So we called him, his name's Ken Graham. And of course, Ken didn't buy any of the hoopla. He, he listened. Though. He, he did listen. He listened, but he, it was because he knew that he hadn't, that God had an assignment for him for us and so he listened and then he invited us to church and so we ended up going to that particular church one Sunday I was probably about four or five months pregnant and whenever we went nobody looked at me with judgment at least I didn't see it like I didn't notice it nobody looked at me with judgment I didn't have a ring on my finger um, people were so nice to us and so we sat through that sermon and it was like it was crazy because it was like the scales were removed from our eyes and we both ended up accepting the Lord like that's at the same time. And then a whole series of events started happening. We got invited to a couple's night at the church and, and then here we go. We're like holding hands in there and I'm like, we're not married. Okay. This is a smaller group of people that we're going to get judged. We're going to get judged. We're going to get judged. Nobody ever judged us. They just welcomed us with open arms. And then over the course of the next couple months, we got convicted and there's a, there's a difference between the Holy Spirit convicting you and condemnation, which is what the enemy wants to do. And condemnation says, you better get married or else. Holy Spirit says, I want you to get married because that's the right thing to do. I want you to, you know, whatever. It's, it's completely different context. And so we got convicted and felt like, wow, this is, my heart was, I'm not going to get married until I'm not pregnant and not as big as a freaking tent. Okay, because I'm, I'm going to look good in my dress. I'm not going to wear a big, huge dress and get pregnant. So what ends up happening? Exactly what I said wouldn't happen. I was eight months pregnant when we got married, and I was wearing a pink dress because they don't make white dresses in that big of a size. And, um, and we got married in my dad's backyard by my uncle, who's a pastor. And, and I got her a $135 ring because that was all I could afford. Literally. That's why I always thought, I'm like, this One ring, you have no idea what box. this means to me because I wore that I wore a silver and cubic ring for so long and I wore that thing proudly. I was, I was proud to wear that. And so when we got networks and started making some money and we got this ring, I'm like, it, it's, it's, it means more just because I know that I, I was perfectly content with what we had back then. And now to be able to have some ice like this, it's, it feels pretty so dang good. I just want to kind of give you guys this visual just kind of picture Dre and I digging our, our, ourselves in this hole with the past that we told you about. And we're, we're digging, we're digging, we're digging, we're digging, we're digging. We got saved, so we stopped digging. But we were still in the hole, yeah. right? We we're still in the hole. We still, I mean, picture like a ladder with like 15 rungs on it. And so now we had to begin the process of getting out of the hole. And it started with uh, facing our past, right? I had to go to jail for two weeks. And I'll remember for the first time reading the whole entire Bible and having all these questions. I visited him in jail every time there was visiting hours. Yeah, she visited me every day. And so, so I had to go through all that. And I remember, I don't know why I always remember this, but it was kind of a defining moment for me. There was a song by Hoobastank called The Reason. I don't know if you ever heard it, but um, basically the, the lyrics and the chorus just start talking about like, I finally have a reason to change basically. And I remember being in there so hopeful and I hadn't had hope for so many years with being divorced and, and the failure and the failure and my the, the suicide and being depressed and all this just hadn't had hope in so long. And even though I'm right there in jail, I'm more hopeful than any time I'd ever been in my life. 
And so I'd like to tell you when I got out of jail, it was all uh, unicorns and rainbows, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. It was a struggle. There's, there's probably a dozen times that we easily could have said, hey, let's call it quits. Hey, I let's even went down to the courthouse while I was pregnant. Okay, so we got married when I was eight months pregnant. So this will tell you how quick things can go south. While I was still pregnant, I went down to the courthouse and I filed the divorce papers. And I took them to him and he ripped them up and threw them back at me. And is like, you're not getting rid of me that easily. <laughs> and I so, was angry. She was angry at me and handed it to me. And I was so angry. I'm like, no, you're not going to win. And it's just, it was just, I was just still in a horrible mental place. And, you know, so, so kind of fast forward a little bit. We, we had some great, uh, we had a great pastor there, made some great friends. We started disassociating with all of our partying friends and hanging out with new friends that were starting families too. And just, we're talking about new things and, and starting to focus in a new direction. And then I ended up going back into the army in 2005 and we got to go through after all the training and all the stuff, we land in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And I see Rachel Tate's on here. So Rachel Tate was a big, huge part of um, my walk. Her and her husband, um, they, don't even, they don't even really know how much of an impact they had on us because, oh, I hate being emotional. And these last few days have been really emotional for me. Um, we started going there and it was like, uh, we, it was like our spiritual walk on steroids. Okay. It was just an amazing place to be. And Chad and I, we decided we were going to join the worship team. And, and what's crazy about that is that when Chad was asked to sing a song at his, at our prior church in Illinois, he remember we were both just like, I light, remember thinking, okay, there's probably going to be the ceiling's going to open up and lightning's going to strike. And it's just, I'm just going to evaporate <laughs> because who am I to think after all my past and all the stuff I'd done that I was worthy of being there. And I, I hadn't, I didn't yet fully grasp <laughs> the concept of salvation and yep. fully grasp the, the free gift that I've been given in the, in the fresh start. So and we, so I guess that real quick, I just want you guys to understand that if you're in a place right now, it is never too late. It doesn't matter if you're 23 like Jerry was or 30 like I was. God He's is always robber. willing to give all of you and us a fresh start and forget about all the things we've done in the past that, yeah. that we regret. It's true. And so when we went to Mana and we were both just kind of felt the burden to join the worship team, we were just like, Ugh. well, we're just, we're just going to do this and see how it goes. And so Rachel this beautiful little blonde with the glasses that y'all can see. Um, her and her husband were the worship leaders. And um, they, I mean, I was smoking cigarettes all up in their choir. They didn't even know it. Like I was barely <laughs> saved singing on the choir and they loved us anyway. Like they, they had just walked us through so much and, and the love and the way that we felt embraced by the rest of the, the worship team. It was just, it was an amazing experience. And then you top it off with an amazing pastor that we had that, that taught in such a way that we were able to learn and retain the information. And we were just so hungry for more and more and more. And we started to see all these different new facets of who God truly was and who we were in him. And I remember um, I had been going through um, just a really, really tough time. I've been having a lot of nightmares at night, and, and I, I was just like kind of paralyzed and stuck in my walk, and I just felt like Satan was just really trying to crush me and make me scared and afraid. And um, we had this night at church where there was a prophet that was coming in. His name's Jim LaFoon, and he's amazing. And we're like, oh, prophet, you know, like this guy is supposed to hear what God is, is speaking, and then he's able to be the vessel and relay the message, God speaking to you. Okay, very personal. So we heard about it, and we were like, <clears throat> okay, we're going to go, but this sounds really hokey. And we'll just, let's just go check this out. Plus, we I, were, I was comparing a prophet like to the guy, you know, you see the signs and you go down. I went into those palm reading places one time, like forever ago. And, you know, I was like, oh, he's wearing a certain watch or he's wearing a shirt. And I'm like, they're going to grab onto that. And that's what I assume this prophet would be like. I had no clue what he was going to do or what. So he when, know. when we were there, first of all, we sang on the worship team because we were there for that night. And then there was probably like 400 people in the whole place. Okay. And we kind of sat, normally we'd sit up towards the front, but we even sat like further back. We were just like, we're just going to sit back in and kind of see what's going on. Like he had pulled some people out of the, the um, congregation, had them come up and he was, he was, you know, talking and, and saying things to them that only God would know about their lives. And we're just sitting back going, 
I hope you don't call us up here. Like, please don't, don't look, don't see us, don't see us. What does he do? Hey, you two, you in the white shirt. Yes, you, yes, come up here. And so we just kind of slinked up there and I still have the recording. I'll never forget this because I, I had already had a relationship established with God. But when this man started talking, I knew it was God because this man knew things about me so personal that only God would know. And no one else in there, I didn't share at that point in my life that my mom was abusive to me. I didn't share that at 15, I ran away from home. And he was saying, all, like he told me ages that I was running away from home. He told me what was going on with my mom and how my mom, it was like she had one personality and all of a sudden something happened and it fried her emotionally and she changed and became a different person. And then he's talking about chat. It, it, I mean, it was just mind blowing. And I was a blubbering, bawling idiot, if you can imagine that. And I was just like, I knew in that moment, I'm like, God is so real. Like I knew he was real, but God is so real to me that God cares enough to use this person to show me that he, he, he knows me, that he knows me so, so well. And, um, that he knows the deepest, darkest parts of me. Now this guy didn't expose like things that would be embarrassing or anything like that. That's not what a good prophet will do. He was very, personal and very unique to me. It wasn't just something that somebody could just pull off and, and say that it could, could be for, you know, 50 people in the room. It was very personal and unique to me. Not only that, he even addressed the nightmares that I was having, which he, he, there's no way he had a clue about that because I didn't tell anybody about that stuff. And um, so anyway, there was that. And then he, he basically, we call it reading mail, read Chad's mail too. Same thing, new mm -hmm. intimate, crazy details. Made a believer out of me from exactly. a total skeptic that showed up to discredit him. And you or... know, and you know what's crazy when we read, when we listen back to that word that we got, this was like 12 years ago that we got that word. Um, the things that he said to us in that prophecy are, are still coming to pass. He said, I'm going to make your marriage a model and what I'm going to do in you and through you could never be done with the two of you apart. Now, in that moment, Chad and I thought, oh, cool. Like, we're going to do something amazing. Like, let's start a Bible study. We're, so we started, we're like, this, this big, amazing marriage model thing is and that we're- Let me share this story part real quick, the Bible study part. Okay, go ahead. And, and here's, I think this is a lesson when I look back now that, that maybe you guys can, can really take in, is that every good decision we make that's going to take us further in life leads to more op opportunities for more, more good decisions. Okay, and I'll, I'll give you an example of that. So- we decided to start a, a, a Bible study. We were in a new town. We were at a new church. We wanted to meet some of the couples, and we'd been in a small group environment before in Illinois, and we loved how that worked out. So they have small groups at Mana Church, and we said, we're going to start one called Young Married and Engaged Couples. So we ended up having a, quite a few uh, married couples come to our house and one engaged couple, right? Now, this engaged couple went through some challenges. They went through some difficulties. We were able to actually share some of our story and help them. And they ended up deciding to get married, which is great because they have children and we feel like we, we were helpful towards that. So they're, they're going to get married. And I went to their wedding to watch them get married. And while I was there, the guy who was marrying them, um, as his, his son was in, our, was in our small group. So we start talking. He starts telling me his son and his wife are, are, are really, really enjoying our small group. And he said, you know what, I'm doing this class because they were just starting this, this Bible college out of Mana Church, Grace College of Divinity. And he said, I'm doing this free class. It's called Destiny and Calling. You should come. I never would have went if he hadn't invited me. I think back now about that. So, so I went and I'm sitting in his class and I'm learning about all this stuff. We're taking these personality tests, you know, kind of like some of you have it with it works. And I'm learning about myself for the first time, about who I am and the, some of the giftings I have. and and all kinds of crazy stuff happen. Like one day I'm, I'm writing at that point, I'm writing some Christian music and I'm writing some lyrics and I go there and he has us read out of the Bible, the exact same lyrics we just wrote. And I'd never remembered reading that in the Bible. And I was like, Whoa, that's kind of crazy. And then he gets all excited about these huge opportunities in Brazil to go minister to the uh, Amera Indians. And he's so excited. There's 200 villages and all we need to do is get people to go there. And I was like, I had that download. I'm like, I want to go. Right. So raise my hand. What do I got to do to go? He's like, just volunteer. And I said, okay, I volunteer. And a few months later, I had my first trip to Brazil on a missions trip. Never a year before that, I never had even considered. I wasn't a guy that would ever go on a missions trip back then. I was like, why would I spend money on that? Why, 
you know, I've got all th kinds of other things to do. So I ended up going to Brazil three times and uh, just had a blast every single time. But it was those, it was our decision to start the group. It was our decision to go to the wedding. It was our decision to take the Destiny and Calling class, the decision to go on the missions trip, which just, and those kinds of things, those, those little choices have come throughout the last decade for us so many times. And I think it's, and we've probably missed a lot of them. And probably one of the most impactful choices that we made, because mind you, I mean, we've struggled through our whole marriage. I don't think anybody who tells you that they get married and everything is peachy keen the whole time, they're liars, okay? Because the Bible says iron sharpens iron, and so you're constantly growing. If you're not growing in your marriage and having some conflict that you're having to work through, that's that's called growth, then um, you're, you're lukewarm and you're stagnant. And you're either growing or you're not, period. You're either getting closer to God or you're not. There's no in between. You're either growing your relationship with him or you're not. And um, so we've gone through so much. There's been a lot of sparks that fly. I am the queen, and I, I will say that I am much better now. I haven't thrown anything in a long time, but I would throw stuff. Like, he would make me so mad. I don't know how many phones I broke. If finally, he knew not to tick me off when I had a phone in my hand because he knew it was going to go straight at his head, and it would end up breaking, and we'd have to go buy another one. I mean, I remember one time he made me so mad, and I said he made me because we I I did that. He didn't really make me do it. I will take ownership. But I had this big thing of silverware, and it was much bigger than these paper clips. And I, he's like, he's like, don't you do it? And I'm like, ah! and I just throw all this silverware, and it goes flying. I don't know how like it Neo missed him. I don't know how it missed him. But I missed him. And that was just like that was probably like five years ago. You know, like so. Actually, it was since we've been in it works. But. Anyway. Well, you know what I learned the other day? And this, this part's for free. I thought this was huge. You guys will love this. So there's two types of people. There are two different types of anger. And I never heard it explained this way. There's firecracker anger, right? That's Some me. of you might be firecracker anger. That's the kind, you're a firecracker and whoever gets burned, you know, whoever's close to the firecracker just gets burned, right? You just get burned. So fire, there's destiny, me. <laughs> <laughs> so there's firecracker anger. And then there's tupper, Tupperware anger. So what's Tupperware anger? Have you guys ever like had leftovers and you put it in the Tupperware and you put it in the refrigerator and like six months later you pull it out and you open it up and you're like, Ugh! it just festers. And that's, that was more me. I'm the one that I stuff it and I'm like, okay, now's not the time to have a conflict. And I, I open up the Tupperware and I stick another problem there and shut it and I stick another thing in there. And then eventually when there's like five, six months go by and there's five or six issues I have in there, I open it up and I just start spreading it and all it was over. always around a time that I was like, I'm really upset with you right now. And I am firecrack. So I'm talking about what's bothering me right now because I don't stuff anything. I'm like, I'm just going to let you know what's going on with me right now. And then five minutes later, I'm going to be over it. That's just how I like, let me say my piece and then we'll move on. So Chad being the stuffer. So I'm like, I'm mad at you because you did this. And, and I'm just really, and so he's just like had it up to here. Cause he's so full of fit. Well, you are, are going to fight. Well, I'll give us 18 things to fight. Next thing so you know, what? he's like, like spewing all this stuff from six months ago. And I'm going, Oh, hell no. Uh-uh. You are not going to be bringing up that stuff. You, that is not fair. You cannot bring that stuff up right now. When I'm trying to talk to you about what I'm upset about, like, no. And so then it just started this huge, crazy cycle. Usually those were the fights where I threw things. And um, I'm happy to say that I don't think I've thrown anything for at least a year. You know, one of the big up. things was instead of fighting against each other, we started fighting Four. for each other and knowing who we're fighting against. And that's one of the things I'm, I'm excited about this book. I, I flipped through it. I know some of you guys are still waiting to get yours and we're going to do, um, you know, it's like, it's like a specific thing to do each day and do some interactive stuff on the, on the posts um, that we're going to be posting. But I just, I just know anything is possible. I mean, I love this book. I do hard things, right? Anything worthy in life, whether it's ha re rearing, um, really good kids who have a great chance to succeed in life. That's work that it takes. It's a fight. You have to fight for your marriage. You have to fight for your children. You have to fight, you know, and, and it works. You got to fight for your team. You just, just anything worthy in life is going to be a fight because, you know, there's an enemy that comes to, to prowling like a lion looking to, to destroy everything that's good in your life. And that's the goal. And so I'm, I'm so proud of you, first of all, for all being on here and saying, you know what? I want to grow. I want to learn. This is like that one choice that you made right here, right? You could have said, nah, there's more things I could do than be on a Zoom with the Canellers. I see them enough. 
But to get on another Zoom and do a Bible study and get on here every single week for the next four weeks, I'm excited that we'll go through. Now, of course, you're going to get out of this about as much as you put into yep. it. So, I mean, from what I can see, it might be 15 minutes, 30 minutes a day, and you're going to be golden going through this and i'm just excited to see well and what you're gonna leads. what you're gonna see too is in the in the group page that i started for us is every day i'm gonna make a post about day one day two and obviously there's five days in each week for this study but we're giving you a full seven every week we're meeting again so that if you take a couple days off you know to spend time with your family and not do this that's completely and totally up to you so you have seven days to get five days worth of work done so make sure that you are making a priority and doing that I would not be surprised if the enemy tries to come in the form of people and distractions to keep you from doing this because um, there's breakthrough on the other side of this so you guys just need to set your wills and set your mind that you're gonna that you're gonna do this that you're gonna commit to it no matter what um, I have to give a shout out to my best friends in the world are on this zoom right now I've got Laurel and Lori these two have done life with Chad and I I hope that you all end up having friends like we have in them Lori's known us since um, gosh really the beginning of our walk Lori was on the worship team and my first friend really and um, like there so she knew me when I was hot mess smoking all up in the choir I was doing her hair smoking cigarettes <laughs> yeah, it was fun they know the good bad and the ugly they and do they and then anyway. Laurel she's been my devoted friend she lives here next to me and they've been through some stuff like they know about throwing stuff and yeah so let me they've let me just there. read this and we'll, we'll pray and close this out I want to read that about the author okay. so this is the this is the book that you either all have or it's on the way tomorrow's day one so here's uh, Havila Cunning, Cunnington, the author, and I love this when I first opened it because I thought this was so relevant. She said, I always knew God had a plan for others' lives, but never felt God could use me. Man, I wonder, I bet if I asked each one of you, some of you probably feel that way right now. I know, I know we felt that way. Uh, I struggled with learning disabilities throughout my school years, hmm. which always caused me to have great insecurity about my value and worth. I knew this was for me. It wasn't until the age of 17, as I was sitting in a car with friends on my way to a party, when I heard the voice of God speak to my heart, there is more to life than this. I have called you, come follow me. I spoke out that moment, telling those in the car that I had a call on my life and they were welcome to come with me, but I was going to serve God. I remember walking into my dark house, kneeling by my bed and saying these simple words, God, I'm not much, I'm young, I'm a girl with no special gifting, but if you can use anyone, you can use me. God specializes in using people who don't think they can be used. Um, I'm young. Oh, wait, I said that already. Now, thinking back to that day, it makes me laugh. How I'd hoped the heavens would have opened up with angels descending and ascending on a heavenly ladder. It didn't happen, but I didn't need it. God heard my cry and was at work to accomplish his perfect will in my life. Just like he's, he's here to accomplish that in each one of your lives, too. So by 19, my twin sister Deborah and I were traveling all over California, preaching, teaching, and singing at any place that would have us. By 21, we had been in seven different states in Mexico, teaching about Jesus and his great plan for this generation. Now at 35, I've been in full-time ministry for 17 years. My husband, Ben, and I are directors of Moral Revolution at Bethel Church in Redding, California. In 2010, we started Living the Good Life Now Ministries, and travel throughout the year speaking at conferences, churches, and retreats. We also have four young sons, Judah, Hudson, Grayson, and Becca, whom we love raising while making frequent trips to the train museum. I believe today is the church's finest hour. If we choose to live with passion, purpose, and walk in power, I'm passionate about seeing individuals encountering God in a real way and seek to blow the lid off common misconceptions, personal limitations, and powerless living so others can become who God has designed them to be. So that's our goal, is that we would all just become who God designed, designed us to be and be able to see that, have more clarity. I'm believing that some of you in this group maybe feel like you're not sure what your purpose is, and by the time you're done with this next four weeks, you're going you're gonna to have that understand what God has planted on your heart, specific giftings he's, he's given to you that you can go apply in your life and, and just... Uh, live a live a full life so we're just excited did you want to add anything else babe? no let's just pray them out so okay. that we can let them go about their day all right father god i thank you so much for the 56 people on mm -hmm. here right now lord lord i just pray that um that they would take this study very seriously lord i, I pray that 15 minutes to 30 minutes every day they would 
just consume themselves, Lord, just, just find the quiet place and that they would just be open to hear what it is that you have to say to them, Lord, and you would use this vehicle of this study and this group to just uh, show them what you have for them, Lord, just that you would become more real to every person on here, Lord, that they would begin to feel uh, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, Lord, they would begin to feel the, the fullness of your love. Lord, if there's anybody on here that just doesn't really, maybe they don't understand what salvation is, Lord, that they would seek that out. They would seek out a, a dreary or someone on, else on this Zoom and just find out and understand what it means, what it means to be saved, Lord, for eternity. And just pray, Father, that, that we would have an amazing time going through this Bible study. And Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for every single individual that's represented here and, and those that couldn't be on that are watching the recording, Lord. I just pray protection over them. I pray protection over their family. I just take authority right now, Lord, over the atmosphere, and I bind up every demonic spirit that might try to come against them. I just um, command them to all be bound up in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that you would just come now and that you would put a hedge of protection around each and every every one of them and around their families, that you would guard them, guard their hearts, guard their minds, and help them to be um, fully, fully committed and transparent to this process of what they're about to go through. And Lord, we just thank you so much that you've given us um, just this platform and, and this company where we can, we can do this unashamedly and we can have these times that we can meet together. And we just thank you, Lord, for so many blessings and for so much. Uh, we thank you ahead of time for everything that's going to come from this. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. It's going to be fun. So stay plugged in. See you later. See y'all later.